Good evening and welcome to another edition of Film Nut. I am your host, Jeff Schubert. Glad you can join us. Well, someone once said that art in any medium is a reaction of the phenomenon of being alive. An artist seeks to absorb and process perceptions and share them with others who may be in different times and places. Art is one of the things that elevates humanity above all other species. And the someone who said that is my guest tonight, a seven-time Emmy Award-winning visual effects supervisor whose credits include Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. He's a little too young for the original series. He is currently working on the NBC show Chuck, and in addition to visual effects, he is credited as the title designer on over 100 films and TV shows, including Wayne's World 1 and 2, and the feature Star Trek Generations. I'm looking forward to talking tonight to Mr. Dan Curry. How you doing, Dan? Okay, how are you doing, Jeff? Thanks so much for coming in, we appreciate right, it. My pleasure. So we'll get into some questions about Chuck and Star Trek, of course, but I want to start off with asking you about the field of visual effects. Mm -hmm. And firstly, would you say it is more of a technical skill or a creative art? I think it's a, uh, like any art form, it's a combination of both and uh, you need a certain level of technical mastery in order to function artistically. Uh, excuse me. Sure. My, something is. Use one of the alien lights that you're gonna demo, tell us what they're about later. Yep. That's um, a little Star Trek prop we'll get to shortly. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a combination of both, but it's primarily an art form. And uh, like uh, painting, you need to understand color and how to apply paint to a surface. Uh, like music, you see, need a certain technical mastery of your instrument before you can really play it musically. So with visual effects, you have to understand the process of filmmaking. But it's uh, also, it needs a natural storyteller because uh, it's really about storytelling and understanding that any visual effect shot that you create must serve the story or it's uh, gratuitous and self-serving. So uh, you have to understand that the moment your shot is in the show or in the movie for the three seconds or seven seconds, however long it's on screen, it's the star of the movie at that time. And it must uh, inform and delight the audience, but it also must uh, carry the story uh, to another level so that uh, the audience uh, is given new information that makes the story that much more absorbing. Now that's the artistic end of it. So from the technical end, do you have to know the software? Is that the CGI, computer generated image guys? Do you have to know Photoshop? Do you have to know geometry, math, angles? Is that the technical Yeah, you stuff? have to, it's kind of all of the above. It requires kind of a renaissance person uh, to do it. You certainly need math. You need uh, a really good grasp of geometry. So uh, for those uh, students learn how to use your compass and divide things properly. Um, and, uh, but not everybody knows every skill or every software, especially the new software uh, has such huge learning curves and is, is daunting that uh, uh, I can't possibly master it. So I am blessed to work in collaboration with many great uh, artists who are also technically savvy with uh, uh, softwares that I'm not familiar with. Well, one of the interesting things we'll get into later is you have a lot of great life experience and cultural experiences that have added to your work over the years on all the various shows you've worked on that make you a better artist, right? I would ho hope to say right. that, yes. Another quote on your website is, uh, craftsmanship and quality of execution are very important to you. How would you define that in terms of being a visual effects supervisor? Well, craftsmanship is starts off with uh, understanding its uh, role in the storytelling process. Uh, begins with composition and choreography, what's going on in the shot, how are you going to move the camera, how are you going to move, say if it's a space shot, move the spaceship, or design a piece of architecture, how it's going to be lit. Um, uh, the blend between live action and the element you're creating, how is that blended together, is it seamless, if it's invisible, um, if you're doing a number of different ships, uh, uh, say if you're photographing models and they're all in the same scene, uh, they should all be lit by the same suns to create that uh, illusion of verisimilitude. What audiences know instinctively is when something doesn't conform with the phenomenon that they experience in everyday life. Uh, for example, on Next Generation, we had a lot of shiny tables, especially in the conference room. So what we would do is whenever we put warp stars out the window, we take advantage of the green or blue reflection on the table 
and then flip the warp stars upside down and key them into the tabletop. That, not that the audience would miss seeing them, but the fact that they're there makes it just feel like, oh, that's what it would be like if there was a right. shiny table in the room, as uh, Michelangelo said, uh, God is in the details when somebody asked him, um, uh, why did you finish the hair on top of David's head? Um, and no one could see it. And he said, well, God see it, and I know it's there. <laughs> and, and so uh, I think that's where you know, craftsmanship and, and quality of execution, which are really synonymous, uh, come into play. It's, it's creating that illusion. If you have somebody on green screen, is the, uh, the mat invisible? Is, is the key line invisible? Are there mat lines? Uh, do you use aerial perspective properly or the background? So let's let's uh, let's focus. get to some of those uh, key lines, mat lines, aerial perspective, because uh, we do like to be a little bit informative as well to the audience who might not know those terms. What are they? Well, aerial perspective is something that um, uh, all painters use if you if you paint realistically, and it's basically giving substance to the air. Um, that, uh, as you know, a light travels through the air and as it hits each molecule in the air or at each particle of water, it bounces around. And so images are both diffused and, and kind of blurred as things get further away from camera. So if you're doing a green screen person, how much out of focus should the background be? Then also what lens is being used? If it's a long lens, uh, then the background would be more out of focus than it would be in a wide lens. And uh, so uh, if you, Recall the uh, the brilliant uh, work in Blade Runner Doug, done by Douglas Trumbull and his team, uh, and you saw those spectacular cityscapes. What they did is they filled the the rooms with smoke, so that it created a scale density to the atmosphere, so that it looked right. Where if you shoot miniatures in normal air, then they look like miniatures because instinctively the Miniatures audience being knows like the model a, of what, a model yeah, of a building. Of a building. They instinctively know that uh, it, it, the air doesn't feel dense enough so it looks like a toy. Wonderful. Well, since you mentioned space and shooting space, I think one of your props uh, sitting in front of us is actual space. Ah. Uh, do you want to pick that up? Sure. In the, in the days before computer animation, uh, again, uh, pioneering people like Douglas Trumbull, Richard Edlund, uh, Dennis Murin uh, would uh, shoot on motion control stages, and this is how we shot things on Next Generation at Image G. And uh, basically, in order to ha be able to light just one area, the model would sit on a modified gear head, like a camera head, that could roll, pitch, and yaw, and was comp controlled by a computer. And then the camera would roll back and forth on a track, then it can go east-west on a track perpendicular to that, and then it could also go up and down while it can pan and tilt. So when we do, say, a flyby, we might place the, the Enterprise here, and then as the camera's going along, it would move by, and then they would, the illusion would, the Enterprise would fly under it. If you wanted to see the bottom of the Enterprise, we'd pick it up, flip it over, and mount it from the top and then turn the camera upside down and then it would look like we were flying under the ship. And a simple flyby could take a day, a really complex shot would take uh, oh, sometimes two or three days to shoot. Um, what you would have to do for the Enterprise would photograph it seven times doing exactly the same thing. Once for its mat pass against a uh, what became Dayglow orange screens. Uh, to, and that would obtain the silhouette. Then we do another version with the beauty light and another version for the window lights. Uh, then we put diffusion filters on and shoot the warp drive so they would have the illusion of glowing. And so by the, then when all of these were put together, then we would assemble it in, uh, in compositing or putting the shot together. And, uh, so, and this technology evolved from uh, aircraft milling. <laughs> Very good. Well, thanks for bringing that. We have uh, an instant message coming in from MC Gray Scatty Love would like to ask, what is the easiest way to get in to the pyrotechnic aspect of the special effects business? Well, to work in a pyrotechnical area, you need a special license to do that. And uh, uh, military training comes in handy. A lot of the guys that are the best pyro people in the industry have military backgrounds where they learned how to safely handle explosives. and. Uh, probably a, a good way to do it is find out who 
are the pyro people whose work you admire most in movies and become an apprentice and work your way up from there and that's that's really the uh, uh, best way to do that. Sounds like good advice. Now, so you worked on the four Star Trek series, now you're working on the NBC show Chuck. That's correct. Um, how are they similar, how are they different? Is is Chuck much e simpler because it's not a science fiction show with all the to-do going on? Yeah, or? Chuck has uh, fewer shots, uh, Star Trek being in the future in space uh, and on alien planets, we had a huge amount of visual effects that were really necessary to drive those stories. We had to create the environment, the space, uh, the spaceships, especially the Enterprise or Voyager or Deep Space Nine were principal characters in the show, so they had to have a personality. Um, with Chuck, uh, it takes place in today's world, and our job is to enhance the production value, uh, make sure that uh, we help the stunt department do um, uh, stunt safely uh, a lot of times with high falls or people hang on the edge of buildings they have wires on so we do wire removal I'm blessed to work with uh, uh, two really great compositors Adam and Luke Avery who compositors uh, uh, are people that put shots put together. different images different shots together and make them look as one is that correct uh, that's correct and uh, they use uh, primarily after effects and then when we need uh, 3d technology computer generated images we form that out usually to uh, Eden effects. Oh, so that's something you guys don't do. So now for fans of Chuck, you'll know this, maybe for, if you haven't seen the show, the, the lead character, Chuck, he's got this computer chip implanted in him that enables him whenever he sees someone who's like, you know, has an overdue library book or some kind of criminal or terrorist, whatever, these crazy things go off in his mind and he could, he knows who they are and where they're wanted and what they've done and he can see visually if they've blown up buildings or what have you. Is that something that your department handles? When we see him, they call it flash on the show. When yeah, we call it, yeah, we call no, the no, mind flashes. I don't flashes. mean to interrupt Jeff, I'm sorry, but the nerd in me needs to cut in here. He doesn't have a computer chip in his brain. Oh. His, lit his brain has literally been reprogrammed to be the storage device of all the information. Uh, that's why it's so special. There's not a computer chip in his brain. Sorry, I had to nerd out for a uh, second. Sorry. Well, thank, thank you, thank you for, thank that you for the nerd out. I, I think it's the first time you have appeared on film not in the new studio, so I'm glad we found a reason to make that happen. Well, actually, I was going to get there. Uh, Chuck is the intersect, the human intersect, right. and, and it's all biological. Mm -hmm. And the uh, he was exposed to this uh, flood of encrypted imagery that uh, gave him uh, access to the secrets of, uh, of both the NSA and the CIA. And uh, when we create the mind flashes, it's uh, a collaboration between uh, every department. Obviously, it starts with the writers. And we uh, then have a graphics department, and they create a lot of the graphic imagery. Uh, then the editors working with the producers come up, and the directors, how does that work into the story? What are the specific images to see? And then visual effects gets involved if we need to distort or make things happen in an unusual way. And especially, we did a... Uh, a 3D episode and uh, we did mind flashes and we had objects that would move in and out of uh, the plane of the the picture plane of the screen and uh, my colleague Adam Avery in the visual effects department did uh, a lot of those uh, brilliantly and just kind of made it very visceral. And how did you accomplish that then? The moving um, the in and out? Uh, by uh, 3D technology changing uh, the uh, the illusion of where the thing is in relationship to the picture plane. Okay, uh, you talked in generally working with all the different departments for this particular thing, um, for the flashing. Generally speaking, who do you work most with interdepartmentally and how do those relationships tend to work? Who does what? Like when you're working with the production designer, for example, or the cinematographer? Well, it, it varies at, uh, depending on what stage of the production you're in. In pre-production, of course, uh, the writers um, and the director and the producer are the the driving creative force, but then we work very closely with the production designer. In the case of Chuck, it's uh, the brilliant Cece DiStefano, and uh, she uh, will will discuss things like, okay, uh, we did a, sh a show where we go to uh, a drive-in movie theater, and it's used to uh, indoctrinate the uh, proto uh, people from uh, the evil fulcrum organization. And so in order to save money, we decided that instead of building a, a huge drive-in movie screen or driving to a great distance, which would then cost uh, the production company the expense of doing it overnight, 
uh, we concluded that the most cost expedient way to approach it would be to build partial uh, the bottom of the uh, drive-in movie screen supports and a small piece for close-ups and Chevy Chase comes out and he delivers a speech in front of it and then for the wide shots. Oh, that's an episode that we've yet to see, right? Yet, yet to see. Scott Bakula and Chevy Chase are making their first appearance, I think, right. coming up this week. And uh, then in the wide shots, uh, we worked with Eden Effects and we did uh, CG versions of the drive-in movie screen. And it's just what's the most uh, bang for the buck in terms of production value and cost expediency. So working with CC and uh, uh, the line producer, Paul Marks, uh, we kind of come up with a, a budget that works uh, in case uh, we aired an episode recently where there's a helicopter tries to shoot our people on the roof of a parking structure. That was a two-parter, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And instead of using a real helicopter, we again collaborated with Eden Effects and used a CG helicopter. But then we did in our department all the bullet holes in the cars so that it wouldn't, we can't damage cars that are too expensive. So uh, that's the in pre-production and production then when we're shooting then we work very closely with the director of photography and the director uh, and special effects department um, and what's going to be practical what's going to be pyro we work very closely with the stunt coordinator uh, the emmy award-winning uh, merit yanka and uh, uh, in terms of how are we going to do the rigs are we going to get wire removal what's going to be on green screen now, does it vary from project to project in terms of um, what's the communication, who does what when? Is it up to the director or the producer to have a, a good handle on the team in terms of fostering chemistry so everyone's kind of on the same page? Because I would imagine there's that opportunity for creative differences. And oh, there certainly are, but uh, the uh, process of filmmaking, whether it's for television or features, is a team sport. And you have to approach it that it, it you can benefit from a lot of great creative intellects and uh, the wise person recognizes and respects the intellects of others and uh, uh, takes advantage of that and uh, on Chuck we are especially blessed with having a, a really cohesive uh, family unit that that creates the show so um, our director of photography is really uh, and, and his camera team are very cooperative and eager to work with us uh, then, of course, we work editorially. Once uh, the, they get into editing the show, the editors tell us, oh, well, can you help us with this or can you do that? And then we'll consult, well, maybe if you slid this shot here or cut this a different way. Um, uh, for example, we're doing one, one thing now where uh, the original scene had was an over-the-shoulder camera just behind Chuck in the foreground and, and seeing another character talking to him. Well, in recutting the scene, the editor concluded that it would be better to have the character Sarah in the foreground. And we didn't have that, and how are we going to get rid of Chuck? So I remembered an earlier episode where we had a close-up of Ivan Strahovski against the green screen turning her head, so it gave us a nice uh, piece of her blonde hair. So I said, well, let's take that green screen, and we'll blow that up and pr print that in the foreground. And so now it'll look like he's talking to Sarah rather than talking to Chuck. So Yvonne being the Sarah character. That's correct. And one moment you mentioned her by her real name and then the other by the character. Yeah, there you go, interchangeably. Um, I remember when we spoke on the phone, you were speaking uh, very positively about that helicopter scene. And I remember watching the episode and you know not batting an eye, you know, thinking it was a real hel helicopter, not thinking to myself, oh, this is obviously some sort of uh, visual effect which le leads me to the question of how do you feel about the difference between visual effects on TV and film? Do you feel like the gap is narrowing between the quality of the, of the two? Well, uh, I actually feel that the, the main difference that leads to a qualitative difference is time and money. And that the, the visual effects artists that work in both media um, tend to uh, approach it the same way, what's the best way we can do the shot and solve the story problem. So I, I tend to think it's uh, a, a budgetary function rather than uh, there's a lesser grade of person working in television than there is in features. Oh, absolutely, and I certainly didn't mean to imply that, but because of the money and the time difference that, you know, that has been the big cause of the difference. Absolutely. I, I just feel like um, the technology feels like it's getting better to Well, they where... use pretty much the same technology mm -hmm. anymore, and especially now that TV's in high def, uh, there's not really uh, a huge difference uh, and 
visual effects be, are becoming a more and more important part of things that you wouldn't expect to be visual effects shows. Um, that uh, you see something like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean and John Knowles, uh, brilliant work with that and, and his team at ILM. Uh, obviously that represents yeah, an incredible investment and had a, an incredibly wonderful uh, solution to those problems. But in, even in simple shows where, uh, say Chuck for example, we may want to have something take place in a different city so we take a piece of uh, Burbank and throw some skyscrapers in the back and change some things and now it's in downtown. And uh, so it's, it's all part of um, of the process and just like doing a simple scene in in uh, Star Wars where maybe there's one thing in the background, well that's like doing one shot for television. Uh, so what are the tools of your trade then that you use to make things happen? Uh, have they improved over the years and what do you recommend to the viewer who maybe doesn't have a big budget what they can use? Well, um, the tools have changed but of course uh, the most important tool is uh, the human imagination. and. Uh, now with uh, the computer technology, uh, software, um, with things like Photoshop, After Effects, Final Cut Pro, Maya, and uh, you know, the more sophisticated softwares, um, the, those tools basically enable us to create anything that could be imagined and in a much faster time. Uh, when I was starting out, for example, matte paintings were done uh, in oils on glass or masonite, and if you were doing an original negative composite, uh, which is basically shooting a live action scene with part of the frame blocked off by black cardboard, then flopping it over and then shooting a painting and mixing it together in camera, uh, uh, that could take months to do one shot, where now with uh, digital compositing and either doing a 3D uh, structure or doing it in, in uh, a d as a digital painting, uh, you can do in a, in a few days what was, would take weeks and weeks uh, beforehand. So the tools are, are very much more robust uh, that uh, just unleashes the imagination. Wonderful, I want to see the force field of the Starship Enterprise. Show me okay. the force field. Well, the, for Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, we were working with uh, Rob Legato, Gary Hutzel, Ron Moore, and our, the, our colleagues in visual effects. Uh, I was looking for some object, uh, and I was in a dry goods store, and I saw this uh, stuff hanging on a wall. Happy New Year, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's, uh, cheerleaders use them for uh -huh. pom-poms. And this is, uh, was in almost most of the episodes of Next Generation, and this is the force field, and what we did is, I set up a mirror at a 45 degree angle. Uh, Gary Hutzel, who is now supervisor on the current Battlestar Galactica, uh, took an old uh, Mitchell camera and I just shook this over a mirror and it gave us a random sparkliness. And by uh, stretching that around in a, a virtual sphere, uh, it also, we used it for phaser hits. Uh, a single frame thrown radically out of focus would be uh, a nebula. Right. Uh, so this was a very handy thing and, and sometimes even today uh, using kind of random elements uh, makes a, a huge difference where sometimes there's a, uh, a computerness about certain CG effects that uh, it's nice to tie in uh, organic elements like that. Was there a cost associated with each phaser hit? Yes. Uh, yeah, for, I was in a, in, a, in a movie called Orgasmo from the creators of South Park, mm -hmm. and they had an or, Orgasmo Raider, I think is what it was called, and every time they hit someone with it, they would spontaneously have an orgasm, that was the bit. And I remember on the set, they were like, be careful, just don't fire that thing haphazardly, because there was a, a physical cost, hard cost, every time that thing went off. So how was it for? Well, the cost per, per uh, phaser was uh, required uh, 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 a talented animator to make that phaser. Right. So it worked out to be about 750 bucks per phaser hit. Um, and uh, one time uh, at a production meeting uh, where uh, we had uh, to focus on saving as much money as possible because we'd spent money on other episodes, we kept um, cutting down the number of phaser hits and phaser hits for space battle. Little hand-to-hand -hand combat in that episode, huh? And uh, so finally, uh, uh, Mitch Susskind, uh, 
uh, visual effects supervisor on the show said, what do you want us to do, have the enterprise so tow a sign that says, bite me? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I like that. Um, I was doing my uh, research for you, and one of the things I came across was that you were talking about how uh, in days earlier than now, you would have to build everything physically, mm -hmm. whereas now you don't. Uh, do you feel like that skill is being lost, and is there a benefit for young visual effects supervisors to still to still take the time to learn to build things? Yes, uh, I. Uh, it, it's it's being diminished because of the power of the computer and the power of the wonderful software, um, but it, it is being lost, especially old techniques like uh, foreground miniatures, things like that. And uh, if you, say if you're trying to do a student film and you would like to uh, have a, a set piece that there's no way you could build one or, and you don't have access to the technology to, to do it in CG, well a lot of people can build a, a reasonable model and if you know how to shoot foreground miniatures, um, you could uh, get production value that would be otherwise unattainable. Uh, for example, my son, when he was in USC film school, was doing a short film that he envisioned taking place in a post-apocalyptic village. And his vision for it was a village that was made out of uh, broken branches and pieces of car hulk and stuff like that. So we went out to a uh, hobby store and bought a couple of car models. and didn't build them properly and I pruned a tree in the backyard and cut out a random piece of foam core and we put an old movie on TV and kind of randomly built this village intentionally randomly so it didn't look planned and then showed him how to set up the camera on a nodal point and, and do that and when he finally brought the film into school people, where'd you get that amazing set? And it's this big and if you are interested in that technology Probably the very best example ever uh, is The Thief of Baghdad starring Sabu and uh, Conrad Veidt made in 1938. It was the same year that The Adventures of Robin Hood, Gone with the Wind, and uh, uh, The Mark of Zorro were made, and Thief of Baghdad was the most expensive film made that year. Well, since you brought up movies, from a visual effects perspective, what are some of your favorite movies or movies that you might recommend to a young artists to see in terms of the execution of their visual effects and to make it fair, specifically ones that you were not a part of? Uh, well, um, I would say the visual effects artists from my generation are here doing this work uh, primarily because of Ray Harryhausen. And I remember when I was 12, on my 12th birthday, my mother took me to Radio City Music Hall to see The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and they had a wonderful display in the lobby of showing different pieces of how Ray did that. And uh, then other Ray Harryhausen films, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which inspired me to do a, build a little uh, rear projection uh, photographic setup so I could have toy dinosaurs br uh, chase my brother by <laughs> rear projecting into tracing paper. Um, and uh, Forbidden Planet is another one that should be seen by uh, every aspiring visual effects artist, uh, MGM film, uh, Leslie Nielsen. It was also uh, one of the things that was uh, an inspiration for Star Trek. Oh, okay. And uh, it was introduced Robbie the Robot to the world. So I think it's wise for a lot of young aspiring people to look at some of the older films, see what was done with uh, baling wire and chewing gum and uh, of course uh, the original King Kong is without peer and uh, the original, uh, the first Star Wars of course just blew everybody away and I think uh, taking those those films into mind uh, and then now you, the young people have a, a set of tools that none of us could have imagined when we were starting out and, and uh, but well, it's good to know history. That's a great list, yeah. Now, getting back to uh, Star Trek, because me and my uh, nerd geek executive producer are big Star Trek fans, you have had a tremendous influence on the Klingon Empire, haven't you? Uh, I say that uh, I've had some influence on it, yes. Sir. So what are some of the things you've done, effects-wise, that Star Trek fans will recognize? Well, I think uh, as far as Klingons are concerned, one of uh, my contributions was Klingon martial arts, Mokbara and the Batleth, and I'm sure uh, Star Trek fans have recognized that curved bladed uh, weapon that was 
kind of inspired by Chinese fighting crescents, but uh, I thought I had been imagining it for years. We had an episode where Worf was to inherit a, uh, a classical Klingon weapon, and they were thinking about doing something that looked like a pirate's cutlass. And I said, no, we, the Klingons deserve better than that. So I made a foam core mock-up and went to the producer and said, look, here's this whole thing that's never existed before, but yet I'm uh, a great fan of sound weapon ergonomics in movies. And I said, well, the ergonomics are sound, and I came up with a whole new martial arts style, and that's where that came from. And, uh, and Michael Dorn, he like he calls you when he wants a new weapon for uh, for war, for right? Yeah, when <laughs> when Michael si signed on to Deep Space Nine, I got this wonderful phone call uh, with his inimitable uh, basso profundo voice, and I answer the phone and it says, Daniel, this is Michael. I need a new weapon. <laughs> and so Michael came over to the house and I showed him a collection of different weapons I have from various parts of the world, and he was uh, particularly intrigued by a. Uh, Tibetan cavalry sword. So I made, so I took a section of that blade and I applied my own theories of kind of hand to hand combat uh, and ergonomics of blades and made a cardboard one, which I still have the original. And uh, we went out in the backyard and fooled around with it and with different poles and stuff. And I had to reinforce it with popsicle sticks. And that became the mechleth. And a lot of uh, architecture of the Klingons became, uh, came out of. Himalayan architecture and working with the great mad artist Sid Dutton at Illusion Arts. Uh, that's where a lot of the, those vistas of Klingon cities For the came Klingon from. homeworld and so forth. We, ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at the true Kaless right here. Sword <laughs> on, of Kaless, on, yes. on, on, on the set of film, that, that's great. And then when we, we did an episode called Sword of Kaless, I made a more Baroque version of the uh, uh, the bat left by having uh, a, a larger decapitation flange and uh, a disembowelment flange in the uh, in the center of the weapon. Yeah, I mean, you know, very nice gentleman, but man, this guy is dangerous. We have another I am coming in, uh, Diablo 37. I wanted to ask if he was asked advice or something by the Star Trek online series guys. No. No, okay. Fair enough. And for some people who are watching the show who might not know who Klingons are, I will say those were a, a race of people on Star Trek. So Star Trek, like Star Wars, has all kinds of alien races. Humans are represented, Vulcans, like uh, Mr. Spock, or like Zachary Quinto, who will be playing Spock in the new Star Trek movie. Uh, Klingons are an alien race. Oh, wait, I actually have a question tonight, and this might be another I don't know answer. Huh? Uh, but uh, the, uh, if you watch the original Star Trek, the, the Klingons essentially look like normal people with just like, you know, with darker skin or something. And like, that's all, they're just normal, the ones with uh, William Shatner. You obviously didn't watch Enterprise, but go on, ask your question. Well, <laughs> well uh, I don't know if I, they can, I didn't watch Enterprise actually. And then they go into the next generation and then when they are actually, it's Deep Space Nine. And then they travel back in time uh, with that Trouble with Troubles episode, where they yeah. kinda, and which is a great special effects episode. Um, but uh, the new, the Star Trek Next Generation Klingons look like crazy beasts with lots of crazy makeup. And then, of course, they're traveled back in time. And when the crew was like, hey, why does this Klingon look so simple and you don't, Worf just goes, uh, we don't discuss it with outsiders. And so, like, did they ever justify that in the series? No, I think that was, uh, that was brilliant, though. In the original series... Actually, may I? Because they did justify it. Um, they, they did justify it in Enterprise, not in that, not in the series that it not, aired not, on. Not in DS9. But in Enterprise, what they did was, is with the human genetic cloning sort of thing. Um, oh, that's right. The, the Klingons mess with the human genetic cloning, and that caused them to look like humans for a few generations. So that's how they, they didn't explain it in Next Generation or Deep Space Nine, or, or Deep Space Nine, but they did in the last, in Enterprise, right? Right, yeah, they went through a period of smooth foreheads, and they lamented the loss of their foreheads that uh, were um, similar to relief maps of Brazil <laughs> and, uh, and kind of like fingerprints. But in the original series, the Klingons, don't forget the Cold War was going on and they were kind of like uh, uh, Russians and they gave them uh, excessively bushy eyebrows. And uh, then in the uh, Star Trek, the motion picture, that's when we began to see them with the crinkled foreheads. And then the, the, one of the Hollywood legendary makeup artists, Michael, Westmore did all the stuff for us on the Star Trek TV series, and uh, I, I think that was a great way to deal with it, though, because uh, I think Dr. Bashir said, well, was there a disease? What caused right, it? Right, right. We never discuss it. Right. And it was a way of recognizing that's a problem, but skirting it in a way that 
it was a, a nod to the audience saying, yeah, we know yeah. We, we made a change, but let's let it go and not make it an important factor in this. Yeah, that was great for DS9, and then they got back to it on uh, Enterprise. Um, well, let's show Voyager some love. I think I'm staring at Voyager right by your feet, right? Yeah, when, um, when we did Voyager, uh, we had a couple of episodes where Voyager would land, and we had it land in, on the 37s. It landed on a planet where we found Amelia Earhart still alive and well. And then in uh, uh, Basics, uh, we landed on a Neolithic planet and were marooned there. And so in order to kind of eyeball where, how the shots would look when we would ultimately shoot the Voyager model and put it in the scene, we had this little foam core mock-up that we would take out on location and we could line it up with the camera like a 1930s forced perspective miniature, just rough, and say, okay, here's about what it would be. And then we'd shoot it as a reference and then we'd pull it out and shoot the real scene. And uh, we had these at different scales, so this one was just uh, uh, handy and it has a very convenient bamboo barbecue skewer on it to hold it up. And I think what, the cast autographed it on the bottom? No, they didn't. <laughs> no, not this one. <laughs> so now, working on all the series, the, the look of the Borg kind of evolved and changed over the various series, right? Not that much. Not that much. Uh, until we got uh, Seven of Nine joining the, the cast, mm -hmm. where she kind of slowly came back to humanity. Mm -hmm. But the Borg was a brilliant invention. The, the uh, uh, I think they're really scary. They first appeared in the episode Q-Who, and we had the, the cool Borg cube that reinforce that aerodynamics are irrelevant in space. And, uh, right. <laughs> Very good. Um, do you go to Star Trek conventions? I've only been to a couple. Uh, the people that run conventions uh, believe that uh, uh, behind the scenes people are not of interest to their uh, convention goers. Wow, um, that's terrible. Uh, and, uh, but one time I, uh, my family and I were invited to attend a Star Trek cruise. Mm -hmm which was uh, an astonishing adventure in social dynamics. <laughs> do you, when you do run into fans, is there like a common thing they want to ask you about when they find out you work in yeah, what you Yeah, they, uh, they, of course, want to know about the actors, what are they like, and uh, what's it like working on the show, what are the hours like. Um, then uh, the, the effect they're most interested in is beaming in and out. And we've had some distinguished visitors to the set, including uh, the Dalai Lama, one time visited this uh, Star Trek set, and he got up on the transporter platform. And, okay, where are you going to be, me? And <laughs> it, uh, uh, he was joking around, but right. uh, <laughs> uh, that. Uh, uh, but it's more or less the world of Star Trek that they were interested hmm. in. And then when they find out I'm um, the uh, inventor of the Batleth, and of course they want to talk about Klingons and and martial arts. Okay. A3 Belly would like to ask, when you were working on Star Trek, would you personally change anything about the series? Well, that's a difficult question. Yeah. Uh, probably the, the change the visual effects department would like most is having more time to do the shots. Right. <laughs> there you go. But the, the writers, and we, we all recognize that Star Trek was uh, greater than the sum of the parts and that it represented something to our audience and to us working on the show that it, it promised humanity a future where we had our act together technologically, where we conquered racism, where we conquered poverty and disease, and yet we retained that spirit of adventure and, and a passion for knowledge. And I think Spock was a, a critical factor, even though it was before my time on the show, uh, that despite the fact that he was theoretically an emotionless Vulcan, he had immense passion for knowledge. And how many times would he see some phenomenon say fascinating? Well, only somebody passionately interested in learning would, would make that remark. And I think that's, that's what it, it's about for us, so. Of all the souls I've encountered in the universe, his was the most human, uh, <laughs> Kirk and Wrath of Khan. Well, speaking of the Star Trek vision, did you ever get a chance to meet Gene Roddenberry? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And Gene was uh, a wonderful man. He was uh, uh, warm, uh, really smart, uh, and what everybody liked about Gene was that he was genuinely appreciative of every person that worked on, on the show. Say, for example, at Christmas parties, Gene would go around to every table, and even though he wouldn't necessarily interact with everybody directly, like, uh, uh, you know, say, you know, some of the people that work on the set, uh, he would, what he'd do, and he'd thank them, and he'd make sure that 
uh, their guests, whether family members or whatever, would, would know how much Jean appreciated their presence. So um, uh, I, th I thought Jean was uh, the real deal. Wonderful. Well, I mentioned in the intro, so I got to ask at least one question about it, uh, title design. You've done that for a bunch of uh, film and TV shows. Mm -hmm. uh, what goes into that? Is that basically uh, punching up a different computer font and picking one you like? Mm -hmm. um, I, know, I know you did Generations uh, title design. Well, uh, it, no, it's more than that. It, a title, a great title sequence is like an overture for an opera. It sets up an expectation for uh, what the promise of the movie to come. It, it sets up uh, uh, it gives the audience time to get used to being in their seat and, and paying attention to what's going on. Um, uh, some of my favorite title sequences, yeah, Next uh, Generations was fun uh, doing the champagne bottle. And that was, uh, we originally were going to shoot a real champagne bottle. And then and I, when I did the storyboards for it, uh, working with uh, director David Carson, we wanted the illusion of the bottle to be free of scale that we couldn't tell it was, it was the size of the monolith from 2001 or if it was a champagne bottle. So we just saw glistening things and we couldn't do a physical champagne bottle because it reflected what was on our motion control stage which was unacceptable. So then we did it as a, uh, as a CG thing so we could map stars onto it so it would look more real. and. Uh, uh, that worked with Santa Barbara Studios. Another collaboration with them uh, was uh, the one of the ones I'm most proud of is the title sequence from Star Trek Voyager, uh, which gave us a, a dream of space travel and the, the kind of images I wanted to see in space and you know, flying through the ring and seeing all that turbidity as the Voyager goes by. So you're, you're working on more than just the text, you're the whole thing. Well, it's the, the, it's the image whole and it's, it's the, uh, and working with the composer, uh, it's the combination of image, uh, sound, and text, and the text has to be correct. Um, some, uh, uh, another one of my favorites was um, Back to School, Rodney Dangerfield movie, and by an amazing coincidence, I grew up in the neighborhood where Rodney's character was supposed to have grown up in, and the director and producer wanted to have me create a little movie to summarize Rodney's character from age 12 to age 55. And so I took a lot of photographs from my family album and stock shots from New York and then painted by hand uh, Rodney's face over uh, blow-ups of my father holding my older brother as a baby uh, and then putting tall and fat signs on different buildings and creating this, this history of this character. And another thing the, the great composer Danny Elfman uh, played on piano for me a here's what I'm thinking of doing with the, with the, with the uh, with the music and normally you would have the music or uh, the the visuals for either the composer to follow or for the title designer to follow in that case we had to do it at the same time so Danny gave me a piece of of sheet music and uh, and said that he was going to do it as 15 frames per beat so then I mathematically analyzed how many uh, frames would be the entire thing and I'd look at the music and say oh here's a glissando maybe we'll do a little swish pan with the camera there and and uh, our first take is what's in the movie. Wonderful well obviously a lot more involved in title design than just the title itself. And cho choosing the right fonts really important. That's right we don't want to overlook that well we got a couple of quick IMs to get to and then we're gonna let you go and okay. the first one is from Ota Kudan 78 are you a big collector of Star Trek items, figures, cards, etc.? Um, I have a collection of stuff uh, that just came, uh, like uh, I requested from the producers uh, Batleth number one, so I have that, and I have stuff I've made, but I don't go out and, and buy Star Trek stuff. I right. just have stuff that... That you've worked on, right? You have like a, a semblance of a Borg cube that healed itself or something, Yeah, right? stuff like that that and I was I saved from the dumpster. And, uh, and paintings and so forth. Yeah, but okay. other, and uh, conceptual design stuff. But other than that, okay. uh, not really. A3 Bellet, were there any disputes behind the scenes of people you worked with that dealt with a certain, a certain way things were done? So kind of like the chemistry between different departments I was asking about before. Yes. Uh, there are always uh, disputes, and uh, when you're working with uh, talented, creative people, 
they normally don't hit uh, this level of accomplishment without having a strong a sense of their own value <laughs> right. and uh, that their opinion is right. And sometimes uh, that would lead to uh, differences of opinion that would uh, create uh, uh, abiding attitudes. And uh, but usually not. Uh, uh, because you always have to recognize that the needs of the production uh, supersede the needs of individual egos. So is that the visual effects way of saying the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one? <laughs> uh, it's the visual effects way of uh, avoiding uh, 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 sociological consequences. There you go. And on TV, the producer would be the, the tiebreaker and in film, the, the director. Producer is, uh, the executive producer is always the tiebreaker. TV is the producer's medium. Uh, features of the okay. director's medium. Now, do you have a favorite set term speak? Back to one, checking the gate. Anything come to mind? It's done. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. I think that is gaining tracking popularity in our little uh, impromptu survey, Brian. It's done. Yeah, we uh, we had different codes, like we have CBB, a shot that was pretty much done. We had to move on, but it meant could be better. Uh, and then we had uh, AFD, a shot that would take all <clears throat> day to accomplish. Fair enough. Well, speaking of it's done, we are done. We are done. Okay. I want to thank you so much for coming in. It was a pleasure meeting and talking to you. Okay. Well, thank you. Great interview. And uh, website? Do you have a, a website that uh, people I, are interested I have, in? My son and uh, a friend created a website of just my uh, personal fine arts work called dancurrygallery.com. dancurrygallery.com. And if you... Two R's in curry. Right. And no, if, you no buy, if you buy the season six uh, DVD set for Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, there's a about a 20 minute uh, documentary on that where I talk about uh, uh, some of the work on on the show and what's particularly nice about it, the people that edited it uh, did a great job where I do a demonstration and then they show how it worked in, in an actual scene from the show. Fantastic, glad we got that in. Thank you everyone, one and all, for tuning in. It's been a great edition of Film Nut. Hope to see you next time. Huh?